Uh, hi guys, uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm glad to be here uh, online today. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, also, thank you for the organizer. I appreciate the organizer, Amit and Amory, for inviting me to speak in the event today. Uh, my name is Elias Barenboim. Uh, I'm fr uh, from, the computer, uh, from the computer science department and the Cause Artificial Intelligence Lab at Columbia University. Uh, check my Twitter uh, if you're interested in discussion, some, sometimes heated, about causal inference, artificial intelligence, and machine learning. Um, also, apologies for my voice. Uh, I'm a little bit sick, but ha very happy to be here today. Um, I will be talking about uh, uh, what I have been thinking about uh, the foundations of artificial intelligence, how it relates to causal inference uh, and, and the, these notions of explainability and decision making. Let me start from the outline of the talk. Uh, I'll start from the beginning, uh, defining what is a causal model. Uh, I introduce uh, uh, three basic results uh, that are somewhat interwined. I usually say that the, the, if you understand them, we understand like 50% of, of what causal inference is about, because um, there's a lot of more technical results, but the conceptual part that is the most important. Um, the first, I'll st start with uh, structural causal models which is the most general definition of a uh, causal model that we know to date, uh, that is by Pearl himself. Then I'll introduce the second and third, or I'd say the second result, uh, which is known as the Pearl causal hierarchy, the PCH, which was named after him. Uh, this is the main metaphor or object, a mathematical object, used by Yuda, Yuda Pearl himself, and then I'm a case in the Book of Why. Uh, if you haven't read the book, uh, please, I like, strongly recommend it. Uh, it's pretty good since it discusses the foundations of causal inference, uh, how it relates to the future of AI and machine learning, uh, more prominently in the last chapter, as well as the intersection of the other sciences. This is work uh, partially based uh, uh, on the chapter that we wrote in honor of Yuda on prose hierarchy and the foundations of causal inference. This is joint work of Juan Correa, Deliver Ibelin, and Thomas Eichert, the first my student at Columbia, and the last two are collaborators from Stanford University. This is kind of the link here uh, to the chapter. Take, take a look at because most of the things that I'm talking here is there in some shape or form. Um, then I, I'll move to a, a, another result that is uh, called the causal hierarchy theorem, um, that uh, which is pr was proved in the chapter is uh, maybe a 20 years old, 20 plus years old open result, and used as one of the main building blocks as one of the main metaphors in the book of life. Then I will try to connect with mainstream machine learning and or more specific of supervised and supervised and reinforcement learning. How does it fit or how it fits with this PCH of the, the causal hierarchy, also called the ladder of causation in the book. Then I, I, I'll move to talk a little bit about what is causal inference and cross layer inferences. Um, I will then move to the design of artificial intelligence uh, artificial intelligence systems with causal capabilities. I will, I will connect with modern machine learning methods and, and refer to or try to put deep learning and RL in perspective. And my focus here will go more on my goal is to introduce the ideas, principles, and some tasks. I will not focus on implementation details. Um, also, I should mention that essentially this is the outline of my course that is a semester course at Columbia. Um, bear with me, I'll try to give you the idea if you're interested to learn more uh, check the reference or talk with me, send me a message. Now, uh, without further ado, let me try to introduce you the idea of, uh, of what is a causal model, or a structural causal model. Um, and we will we, we use the idea or leverage this idea from, from the processes. We we'll take a process-based approach uh, to causality. Uh, and the idea is borrowed from physics, chemistry, sometimes economics, and other fields. Uh, other fields that we have a collection of mechanisms that underline us some, some phenomena that we're analyzing. In this case, suppose that you're trying to understand uh, the effect of taking some drug on the, on, on the headache, uh, and those are observable variables. And we have the corresponding mechanisms here, F sub D for the variable drug, and F sub, F sub H to the variable headache. Each mechanism uh, takes as input, or has as argument, uh, a set of observables, in the case of F sub D H, uh, and an observables, in this case, U sub D. This unobservable here is like all other all variables in the universe that generate variation to drug. That is not age can be included in this U sub D. And the same here with the U sub H. 
that is the drug and age that are observables goes to the transformation F sub H with the U sub H, again, all variables in the universe that are not uh, uh, drug and age, and someone will have or not have headache. Um, this is, a, this is the, the real processes. Usually we have a co possibly complicated function here in this F sub G, F sub H that is instantiated. Usually we move some type of, we have some type of coarsening, and this is the causal graph related to this collection of mechanisms. The causal graph is nothing than the, the, the partial specification of the system in which the arrows here just means that some, that some variable uh, is participates in the mechanism of the other. But I just put X, Y, Z to make my communication, our communication easier. Um, now we have, for example, that uh, uh, age participates in the mechanism uh, of headache, F sub H, and then there is an arrow here from Z to Y, from H to headache. The same with drug, there's this arrow from X to Y, and the same age here also participates in the F sub D. Note here that in the graph, we don't have the particular instantiation of the function. We are just preserving the arguments that we have there. Now, for sure, uh, we can uh, we can try. To, uh, this is the process that is kind of unfolding in time. We can sample sample from a process like that. This this gives rise to a distribution, uh, observational or non-experimental distribution over the observables p, z, x, and y in this case. Usually when you are doing machine learning, supervised learning or unsupervised learning, we are playing about this, this side here of the equation. Here we are trying to understand causality. Uh, causality is about when you go to the system uh, and you change something or you overwrite, overwrite some, as a computer science, we both got like this, we write or overwrite some function. Here we like to overwrite the equation, the natural way of how people is taking drug. Here is drug is equal to yes. This is called also uh, introduced organically here, given the time, but this is related to the dual, dual operator in which you overwrite the original mechanism F sub D. In this case, it's do X is equal to yes, that now we no longer have our original equation. We have a constant here. And you can have another constant that is a constant no on the other side. I don't have time in the slides. Uh, and this, you know, that, that's what we have. Um, here, this is semantics without necessarily uh, having access to the, the mechanism themselves. This is the meaning of the operation. Now here is the graphical the, the graphical counterpart of that. Note that in, in there is the F sub D here. We no longer has the age as an argument of this function. There is just the constant. Then you put the constant here. And we cut relative to this graph. You cut these incoming arrows to other X. This is the mutilated graph. Again, if you are able to contrive reality in this way, you can sample from this distribution or from this process, which gives rise to the distribution called interventional distribution or experimental distribution, P of Z, Y, given do X is equal to yes. Now, the, I use these uh, variables here, X, Z, and Y, but X could be any decision, Y can be any outcome, and Z can be any set of covariates or features. Um, now, what is the challenge here? The challenge that in reality, this upper floor here is almost never observed. This is usually called unobserved. This is why I put in gray. Then this is one of the things we don't have that in practice or very rarely. And another challenge, usually you observe the data that we have, it's coming from the left side that is coming from this naturally unfolding or how the, the system is naturally evolving. And we like to understand what is the effect if you go there and do the intervention in the system and with our own, our own will or deliberately as a policy maker or decision maker decide to set this variable x is equal to yes. Then we have data from the left from seeing and you like to do inference about what would happen if you do something in this system. Now um, we can try to generalize this idea and define uh, what is the uh, structural causal model. This is chapter chapter in causality book Pro 2000. Uh, I'll not go to the definition step by step. I suffice here to say that we have a set of observables or endogenous variables like age, drug, or headache. We have a set of exogenous or, as I said, unobserved variables that could be the U sub D and the U sub H that we have before. And we have a collection of mechanisms for each of these observed variables. We have a mechanism, the F sub D or F sub H, excuse me. Uh, this three here is related. It could be seen as some type of Newtonian physics to kind of summarize the conditions out, outside the system. Excuse me. 
outside the system. Uh, if you want to some area, kind of sprink, sprinkle mass of probability mass, and you have this probability P of U over the exogenous variable. Now, we understand very well how these systems work. There is this awesome work by Halpern, as a logician in Cornell, and Gallas and Pro, uh, giving this type of very solid type of understanding over these systems. Now, today we are interested in a different result that is the following. Once we have a SCM, a structural causal model M, that is fixed for the particular environment or setting that we embedded uh, the particular agents, this induces this pro-causal hierarchy or the PCH uh, that is called the ladder of causation uh, in the book of Y. Let me try to, let's try to understand what is the PCH. Here is the PCH. Uh, there are different layers of the hierarchy. Uh, this is the first la la layer. Um, that is called the associational layer is related to the activity of seeing uh, how would seeing some variable x is equal to small x change my belief in the variable y or what does a symptom tell us about the disease uh, syntactically this is written as this p of y given x quite important people ask this layer but it is this is very related to the uh, machine learning supervised and unsupervised learning there are many different types of formulas there. Base nets is one, one type of model of formulas for there. You have decision trees. You have super vector machines. You have the deep neural networks and other type of types of net networks. Uh, they all live in this layer here. Quite important, we have been trying to scale up inferences here, given this X could be the pixels themselves or a set of features could be in the order of thousands of even millions. And we like to try to predict a Y that is some label you have kind of pixels and you like to know if it's a cat or not. It's kind of classic and it's very hard. We're kind of mastering that or understanding pretty well how to do that in recent breakthroughs in the field or in the last 20 years, I should say. Now we have a qualitatively different layer that is layer two, that is the interventional, um, is related to the activity of doing. What if I do X actions? What if I take the aspirin? Why will my headache be cured? Um, the counterpart in machine learning will be reinforcement learning. You have a causal Bayesian networks, Markov decision processes, partially observable MDPs, and so on. Um, quite important, I will comment more about that. Uh, symbolically, by the way, you, you say P of Y given do X comma C. That's the, the, the notation that we have. Now we have a qualitatively different layer that is layer three. Uh, that is a counterfactual layer. I will go back here soon, but it's related to the activities of imagination. If you want agents to have imagination, retrospection, intro, introspection, blame, responsibility, credit assignment. Uh, it is the layer that gave the name for the book of why. This is the why type of question. What if I had acted differently? Uh, was it the aspirin that stopped my headache? Uh, Syntactically, we have this kind of nested counterfactual here. I took the drug that is X prime as instantiation of the big X, uh, pardon for my license here, X prime, I took the drug uh, uh, and, and I'm cured, that is Y prime. Now you can ask, I would be with the headache, that is Y, the opposite of Y prime, had I not taken the drug, that is the X, that is the opposite of X prime. I took the drug and I'm good, X prime and Y prime in the actual world, in this world, and I ask, uh, what if, I hadn't taken the drug, that is X, would I be okay, that is the Y, or not okay, that is the Y, okay, would be not, not Y. Then there's no counterpart exactly in machine learning. Uh, if you have some particular instance, you can ask me offline, but uh, because whatever, there is all kinds of things written in the literature, this comes from the structural causal model. Um, now I would like to, to try to see what is going beyond machine learning. I already have men just mentioned this layer three here. Uh, specifically, I'd like to highlight a different family of tasks, of inferential tasks, which follows very naturally uh, causally, that is called this cross-layer task, cross-layer type of inferences, uh, as I, I'm saying here. Um, layer one is related to saying, suppose that as input, we have some kind of data here, and most of the available data to today is observational. It's possibly collected. Elias numbers here, 99% of the data that we have is coming from layer one. And Elias numbers as well, you can blame me if someone complains with you, but 99, or let's put 90% of the inferences that we want to do today is about doing, or action, or layer three, about uh, counterfactuals, uh, and, and about policies, treatments, and decisions, just to cite a few examples. Then, his search question that we're trying to answer here, across layers, 
that we have the data and the inference that we want to do is how to use the data collected from observations passively, that is layer one, can maybe coming from the hospital, to answer uh, questions about the interventions that is layer two. Um, uh, under what conditions uh, can we do that? Now, why is this task different uh, is a, uh, usually a good question. Why is the causal problem non-trivial? Um, the, the, and the, the, the answer is like SCM are almost never observed, but for a few exceptions, such as in, such as in fields, uh, such as fields, uh, uh, such as physics, sorry, uh, chemistry and biology, uh, biology sometimes, uh, in which the very target there is to learn about this collection of mechanisms, in general, we do not observe uh, the SCM. In the, most of the fields that we are in AI machine learning, we are interested uh, that there's the human in the loop, some type of some type of interactions that we cannot, given that we cannot read minds and we don't kind of isolate the environment in some kind of precise way, you don't have a controlled environment, uh, usually you cannot get the SCM itself. Still, the observation here that the PCH still exists, the, the, this collection of mechanisms that underlines the system that we're trying to understand is still there, inducing the PCH, and you could still have the query or the, the, the task, the cross-layer task, how can you get from data, from data that is from, from a fragment that we have from the SCM, you can try to infer about uh, that is layer one, observational, how can you um, answer the question layer two? Then you have this unobserved phenomena here, and you are trying to get fragments that are observed, some other fragments that are at least realizable, how can, that could be layer three as well. How can you move across these layers? Um, I like a lot, I use in the class, and we spend a little bit of time, but I like the allegory of the plateau cave as a metaphor here, since um, there is this complicated reality, usually you just observe the fragments or the shadows of these realities that is kind of fragments of the PCH, and we like to do an inference about the outside world under what conditions can we do that. That's kind of the flavor uh, or the consequence of this mechanism that could be the other layers, layer two or layer three, for example. Um, I would like to talk about uh, possibility results or this cross-layer layer inferences. Um, uh, as usual, uh, let, let me read the task here. Uh, infer the causal quantity y given to x from layer three from observational data that is layer one. That's exactly the class that the task that I just showed. Now, the, the effect of X and Y is not identifiable ID from the observed data. Proof, there exists a collection of mechanisms or SCMs capable of generating the same observed behavior, layer one, P of X and Y, while disagreeing with respect to the causal query. To witness, uh, we will show two models. This is model one, this is model two, such that they generate the same, I'll not parse the model here. It's just for you to go home and, and think a little bit, but there are two simple models here. This is XOR, by the way, not X, XOR, U. Uh, there are these two, mo these two models generate the same observed, this is model one, P1 and P2, the same observed behavior in layer one. However, they generate different layer two behaviors, different layer two predictions. Uh, in this case, excuse me, in this case, Layer two here is saying that the probability of y given to x1 is equal to half, while model two is saying that is one. Then in other words, we, uh, uh, we have a kind of uh, layer one under the terms, what can we say about layer two? There's not enough information there to move. And we can, yeah, anyhow, that's the result. Let me, I would like to, to now to make a broader statement, generalize this idea. Again, this is joint work with Correa, Ibelin, and Eckhart. From the paper that I mentioned earlier, um, the the that prove the following result uh, theorem with respect to the bad measure over uh, there is some kind of technical conditions measure over SCM, the subset in which any PCH collapse is measure zero. Let me let me read the informal version here. Uh, you go home later and you can try to parse that. But informally, for almost any SCM, in other words, almost any possible environment in which your agent or your system is embedded, the PCA doesn't collapse. In other words, the layers uh, of the hierarchy remains distinct. In other words, you have this hierarchy here. Th th there is some kind of, th this will not happen, that one layer usually underdetermines the others. There is more knowledge in layer two than in layer one alone. There is more knowledge in layer three than in layer one and layer two. 
then one layer under determines the other. You don't get this type of situation. Um, this caused the open problem. I, I, I say that is uh, stated in the book of why, uh, as a, a corollary, you can go to chapter one that says that the answer to answer a question at layer I about a certain type of interaction could be layer two about the intervention. One needs knowledge at layer I, two, or above. Now, the, the natural question here that we could be asking is like, Elias, then after all, how are causal inferences, are causal inferences possible? Or how are causal inferences possible? Uh, I get commonly now, um, um, the, is this a, a, a impossible? Does it mean that we shouldn't do causal inference at all, given that we have this type of underdetermination from one layer to another? And the answer is not, not at all. Um, the idea here, this motivates the following observation. If you know a little bit about, if you know zero about the SCM, this is the CHP, the causal hierarchy theorem that I just gave. If you know a little bit about the SCM, um, maybe possible. And what is this little bit? Little bit is what we call the structural constraints which can be encoded in a graphical model. You have different graphical models here. You can have a graphical model that is a layer one graphical model, layer two and so on. Um, then in principle, uh, uh, it could be possible to move across layers, depending on how you we encode these constraints here. There's new families of graphical models. I would like to examine it just for one minute, the, the graphical model layer one here that is very popular, um, uh, such as a Bayesian network that is layer one versus a causal base net. But I'll start with a base net. net. It's not all graphical models are created equal. This is the same ta task. From the previous theorem, it was shown that it's impossible to, to move from layer one data to layer two type of statement. Now, what if you have a base net that is compatible with the data? Now, this is a, a base net that is compatible with the data, x pointing to y, whatever data we get over x, y. And we would like to know what is the P of Y layer two quantity, Y do X in this case. Um, if you play a little bit, uh, or if you know a little bit of causality, there is no unobserved confounder here in this graph. Then the P of Y given to X is equal to P of Y given X by ignorability or backdoor admissibility. Those are names that you use to say this unobserved confounder. Now I'd like to pick another BN, another layer one object, flip the arrow not, no longer from X to Y, but is from Y to X and see what would be the causal effect of X and Y. Uh, in this case, the Y given do X, uh, still compatible. Now it turns out for the semantics of causal inference or, or of intervention, the do, you'll be cutting the arrow here that is coming from the X because we are the one controlling the system, which give P of Y given do X turns out to be equal to P of Y. Then this here highlights that they have different answers. We couldn't. There is not enough information about the underlying SCM in the BM so, so as to allow causal inferences. Just, just say that this is not good, even though the constraints could be coming from the SCM, it's still a layer one object is not good. This is not a BN that we are looking. Now I'd like to consider a second object that is a layer two kind of graphical model. You go to the paper that we define more formally, I'll not do that here. But it's possible to encode layer two constraints that are coming from the SCM, the idea of the asymmetry of the causal relations. And we like to focus on this one now. Now, the idea is like there are positive instances that we can do cross layer inferences. Let's consider a graphical model. This is L2 graphical models. The mental picture that I will, I would like you to construct is the following. Suppose that this is the space of all cause, all structural models. Here are the models, models compatible with the graph G. It is a L2 graph, graphical model. These are the models that SCM is compatible with PV, could generate this observed distribution. And here are the models that are, in the intersection of these guys, you have the models that are giving the same Y given to X. What I'm saying in reality, there are situations that for any two structural model encoding this unobserved nature, let's call nature N1 and 2, such that they have the same graph G, G of N1 is equal to GN2 layer 2. If they generate the same PV, the same observed distribution, then they will generate the same causal distribution. Then that's the notion of identifiability. It is possible to get in some settings. Then let me try to summarize what I said so far. Uh, some, it's about some sort of tension between the reality and reality that is this true underlying mechanism that we don't have, and our model of reality that will be the graphical model, for example, could be other, 
or and the data. We started from a well defined uh, world, semantically speaking, in which an SCM, a pair F and P of U, mechanisms and distribution over the exogenous, implying the PCH, this three, which means these different aspects of their nature and types of behavior, layer one, layer two, layer three. We do acknowledge that the collection of mechanisms are there, but inference are limited given that the SCM is almost never observable or observed due to the CHT. We have this constraint about how to move across the layers. Now we move towards scenarios in which partial knowledge of the SCM is available that is encoded such as a causal graph, a layer two causal graph. Causal inference theory then help us to determine whether the causal target, ta the targeted inference is allowed. In the prior example, the inference is from layer one to layer two. Namely, we are trying to understand if the graph plus the PV that is layer one distribution allows us to answer the P of Y given to X. Now, observation here, sometimes this is not possible. I mean, for weak models, if you have a weak model, the mental picture here is like, sometimes the true model is generating this green guy here, this, this distribution. There is another model that have the same graph G and can induce the same observation distribution and generate another guy that's called P star of Y given to X. Then in a, in, a, in a situation that we cannot do the inference about layer three, just with L1 data. Now I would like to spend uh, two minutes just doing a summary of the reinforcement. How does reinforcement learning fit into this picture? I spent almost three hours in a tutorial last week in ICML uh, talking about that. Go to the crl.causeyi.net if you want the details. I'll try to give you two minutes what happened there. Uh, this is the PCH. Now my comment here that typical RL is usually confined to layer two or subset of layer two. Usually we cannot move from, from layer one, we cannot leverage the data that is from layer one or very rarely. And this also RL doesn't support us to make statement about layer three or uh, about counterfactuals, layer three type of counterfactuals. Then that's the uh, global picture. Uh, this is the kind of uh, canonical picture, picture of RL that we have an agent uh, and I, that is embedded in the environment. The agent is a collection of parameters. The agent observes some kind of context of states, commits to an action, and then observe a reward. Uh, there's a lot of discussion about being model based or model free. I would like to say that all model based that they mentioned today in the literature is not causal model based, it's a causal. It's important to not to get confused. You can ask me more later. Now, the only difference here from the causal reinforcement learning perspective, that is what the, 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 that we leverage, and I spent three hours, almost three hours discussing that in the tutorial, that now officially the collection of mechanisms that we just studied, the structural causal model would be the model of the environment officially. And the, the agent side will have this graph G. Now the two key observations, again, the environment and the agent will be tied to the pair SCM in the environment side, environmental side, and the causal graph in the agent side. We'll define different types of actions or interactions following the PCH, which means that observing, experimenting, and imagining will be these different modes Please check the crl.causeoi for more details there. Um, let me skip this one here. You can check later about uh, the different types of tasks that were not acknowledged before. Um, I would like just now to move quickly and spend 30 seconds discussing how does the deep learning fit in this picture. Uh, here's the same picture that I have before from the left side, observational in the five slide, 10 slides ago, and the right side, the interventional world. Now, like to, in reality, this is, this is about reality and model. This is every abstraction. In reality, we have a data, and you can sample from the data, and this allows us to get the hat distribution, the p hat. And we have some results saying that the distance between the hat distribution and the, the original distribution keeps decreasing, which makes sense to operate in terms of the hat distribution. Now, for sure, you can use some kind of uh, formalism to try to learn the hat distribution, including a deep network or a variation of that. Now, challenge. Usually you are interested in this inference in the right side and you have zero data points in the right side. I'm talking broadly, not reinforcement learning. Um, the reinforcement learning have other problems, but uh, you have zero here. Now, how on earth can you learn about the hat of this distribution? Some people is, is connecting the output of the DNN that you learn from the left side to the right side, which is kind of put a, a guy like that. There is nothing in the data, in this data, nor in the deep net that takes into account the structural constraints that you discuss and not, not or, nor the CHT. 
then it makes no sense to connect. There's something missing there. Then um, I could talk maybe uh, uh, one hour, you invite me to talk about the relationship between neural nets and causal inference, but I think this is the picture that I want to start the conversation. Now, I'd like to conclude, um, uh, and apologies for the short time, it's like very, very short uh, talk, but, uh, and, and thanks for the opportunity. Now, let me conclude, causal inference and AI are fundamentally interwined, no, and novel learn learning opportunities emerge when this connection is fully understood. Most of the impediments for general AI today are orthogonal to the current a causal methods available in ML. We're not even touching the problems, the impediments for general AI, including uh, deep learning, the huge advances that we have in deep learning and reinforcement learning. In practice, failure to acknowledge the distinct features of causality almost always lead to poor decision-making and superficial type of uh, explanations. The goal here, the agenda that we have been pursuing maybe for almost 10 years now, we like to develop, a, we are developing a framework a set of principal algorithms and tools for designing causally sensible AI systems, integrating these three PCH, observational, interventional, and counterfactual data, modes of reasoning, and knowledge. And my belief strongly is that this will lead to a natural treatment of human-like explainability, given that we are causal machines and rational decision-making. Um, I would like to, to thank you for, for uh, listening and also this is joint collab and my collaborators, this joint work with the Causal AI Lab uh, at Columbia and collaborators. Uh, thank you, Juan, Sangak, John Z, Yuda, Andrew, Dulliger, and Thomas, um, and all the others that are. This is a huge effort. Uh, thanks, and I'll, I'll be glad to take questions.